Thank you for this moment. I don't deserve it. Of course, I have arthritis, and I don't deserve that either. <clears throat> but I'm grateful for this award, which I will share with the people who really deserve it, whom I will introduce to you in a few moments. But thanks to you, Judge Lippman, for those generous words about my work. But thank you more so for your skilled, patient, and successful leadership of the Rikers Commission. I learned in watching you over these months now that you would have fit well into the world of Lyndon Johnson, who loved to tell the story of the gambler in Texas who would say to his mark, play the cards fair, Reuben. I know what I dealt you. <laughs> Our city's largest jail is a microcosm of everything wrong with America's criminal justice system. Four out of five detainees there are presumptively innocent, awaiting trials in our backlog courts that sometimes take years to adjudicate cases. Rikers embodies the scourge of racial bias in New York's prisons. Over half of its detainees there are African Americans a third are Latino. Because it cost $247,000 to keep one detainee on Rikers every year, the jail dramatizes the astonishing cost of incarceration in America today. $80 billion annually to run all federal and state prisons and local jails. The full cost of mass incarceration has been estimated in excess of $1 trillion a year, with about half of that burden falling on families, children, and communities of color. And how do we calculate the hidden cost on a human being who spends months or years in a seven by nine foot cell with so little human contact of worth, not touching the ones you love. Most of us in this room have likely heard, if not read, the famous book by Alexis de Tocqueville, written by the young French scholar, diplomat, and political scientist Alexis de Tocqueville in the first half of the 19th century. Most likely don't know that de Tocqueville and his companion, Gustave de Beaumont, were actually sent here by the French government in 1831 to study our prisons. They went from the Auburn prison in upstate New York to the Philadelphia Central Prison and two others. They concluded their report with these words. To sum up the whole of this point, it must be acknowledged that the penitentiary system in America is severe. While society in the United States gives the most, the example of the most extended liberty, the prisons of the same country offer the spectacle of the most complete despotism. So it took courage, Judge Lippman, to take on the despotism of Rikers, to challenge the reality of sanctioned cruelty and the politics and bias that feed it. Mayor de Blasio suggested earlier this week that the reforms proposed by your commission, if they are accomplished, will lead to a fair city. And he meant not a city of physical beauty, but one more just, the greatest beauty the eye can behold. You, sir, are the real trailblazer here tonight, and I would like our audience to stand and salute you.
Thanks, too, to John Jay College for the work you do and for hosting tonight's event. To President Carol Mason, newly arrived and seriously mission-driven. Her predecessor, Jeremy Travis, who gave my team and me so much support by enthusiastically embracing Rikers. To Steve Handelman, Director of the Center on Media, Crime and Justice, and Editor-in-Chief in charge of the Crime Report. I'm often asked, what's the mission of journalism? And for years, I give the same answer. To get your readers or viewers, the public, as close as possible to the verifiable truth. Through the years, Steve and his colleagues at the Center have utilized the evidence-based collaboration of over 800 reporters and editors and countless scholars and practitioners to get us closer than ever to the verifiable truth about how our criminal justice system works. I look, at to, look out tonight at the young journalists who are here, recipients of the awards for excellence in criminal justice reporting, as well as the 2018 reporting fellows who are here, and I take heart at the quality and the character of the work being done today. We journalists have a duty to warn, and there is plenty to warn about the direction of criminal justice. And I hope all of you take note that you're in the presence of the one journalist in New York City who most consistently keeps criminal justice at the forefront of public attention, Errol Morris. Where are you, Errol? There you are. When, 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 when people ask me, where is the center of New York? I say it's wherever Errol Morris is. Thank you for being here. And thanks as well to the Harry Frank Guggenheim Foundation for sponsoring this occasion. Your annual Symposium on Crime in America is itself a graduate course in, journal, in ju criminal justice journalism. In the interest of full disclosure, I must tell you that Harry Frank Guggenheim, Captain Guggenheim to many of us, hired me in 1967 as publisher of Newsday, the daily on Long Island that was then the country's largest suburban daily. That was one big favor he did for me. He did me a second one four years later when he fired me. <laughs> Through circumstances still a mystery to me, I wound up in broadcasting where I have spent the past 45 years. It's not hard to do what I have done over these many years in broadcasting. You have to have some skills. If you're running your own independent operation, you have to be able to raise the money to pay the bills. You have to be smart enough to hire colleagues better at what they do than you are at what you do. You have to keep reminding yourself every day that you may be the conductor, but you're not the first violinist. You don't even have the wind power to get an oomph out of the third tuba. The chamber orchestra that produced our Rockers film is here tonight. I'll ask you to stand. Filmmakers Mark Levin and Mark Benjamin. The, the, perfect, the perfect pair for Rockers because of their long experience with criminal justice issues. Our producer, Rola K. Bamboche. <laughs> who did so many of those interviews you saw. Now at Vice News. Kobe Kelly, the director of media communications who has been responsible for the outreach. <laughs> and my closest colleague and innovator over the past 32 years, our senior executive producer, Judy Doctorow. To do your best work in this field, you have to keep reminding yourself that you are never better than your sources. In broadcasting, that is essential because there is no production value more important than the human face. And no one knows more than the human being who has lived the experience 
that is the subject of whatever film you're doing at the moment. And as the judge said, Rikers is told from the perspective of former and current detainees who endured this island's culture of cruelty. They shared their stories with us because they don't want others to go through what they did. The height of compassion and empathy. empathy. It's what you need to counterattack the world today. We asked some of them to come tonight, and I would like each of them to stand up and remain standing until I've introduced each one. Pastor Benny Custodio. I, I thank the world of you, not only because, like me, you have a divinity degree. Uh, I, in fact, I should say the Reverend Dr. Hector Custodio, who started his education while incarcerated and earned his PhD last December. <laughs> Kadeem Gibbs. Where are you, Kadeem? Ah, oh, Kadeem. Has, Kadeem has been doing the hard work of community development and is devoted to working with adolescents in an effort to keep them out of the prison pipeline. Kathy Morris. Kathy. <laughs> Kathy, you have helped dozens of incarcerated people to get an education, and you're tireless in raising awareness of the increase in incarceration rates among women, rates that are rising faster now than those for men. Ismael Nazario. Where are you, Ismael? <laughs> Ismael is at Ishmael is at the Fortune Society, and he's been putting his eloquence and his activism at the service of Ban the Box, Raise the Age, and other reform campaigns. Johnny Perez, where are you, Johnny? Johnny. I, 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 will, never, I will never forget when Johnny and Judge Lipman and I appeared at the New York Bar Association. Johnny told that packed audience of how when his mother came to see him at Rikers, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, when, when his mother came to see him at Rikers, she had to wait eight hours in line. And when she finally got to see him, the guard said, you have 15 minutes left. Is that right? Johnny, you're now leading the campaign against solitary confinement for the National Religious Campaign Against Torture. Thank you. And the eloquent Damien Stapleton. Damien? Damien? Damien got off parole this past summer and has been traveling with our team around the country to screen the film and alert people to the realities of why our criminal justice system is itself criminal. Without your trust and courage, brothers, without your faithful witness, I wouldn't be up here this evening. I really have not blazed any trails that haven't been lighted by the truth of other people's experiences. And in this case, Johnny and Ishmael and Kathy, Kadeem, Damien and Benny, and the others who appear in the film, all of whom I am persuaded, spoke faithfully. Thank you. But why? To what end? What's in it for them? Their truth is painful. It can bring no joy or erase the past or even get you in a job that puts little premium on rewarding criminal behavior unless it's committed by politicians financiers, and celebrities. Listening to you, did anyone in this room think tonight, don't we want that person here as an intern 
or with a scholarship or on the staff, paid a living wage? Who knows more than the experts from inside? And as the poet Virgil said, believe an expert, believe one who has proved it. And they have proved it. Now, I'm supposed to finish at this moment, about one-tenth through the way of my speech. <laughs> but I'm going to take a few more minutes to answer a question that people have asked me at age 82. Why did you commission this film on Rikers? There are many reasons, answers, and I've resorted to all of them. But all of them are not the main reason. The real reason was sort of for 50 years in the making. Rikers rounds out the circle of my own experience with the criminal justice system. I had a couple of brushes with the law when I was a mischievous kid growing up in a small town in East Texas. But each time the police didn't take me to jail, they took my home, me home and told my parents, my father's best friend was Shorty Blackman, who was the deputy police chief. That's all they needed to do. Watch this boy, he's mischievous, they said. My real introduction to the criminal justice system began at the top. Just over 50 years ago, when I was a young man working in the White House as an assistant to President Lyndon Johnson, my assignment was domestic policy before I became press secretary. It fell to me in 1965 to help put together a group of experts to study America's criminal justice system. Even now, half a century later, what was called the President's Commission on Law Enforcement and Administration of Justice is recognized as the most influential study of crime and justice ever undertaken in America. Not because of anything I did, but because the 19 people on the commission really worked hard. Joe Califano took over my responsibilities after I left to come to New York. And because LBJ wanted it to signify, to make a difference and change things. If you read the transcripts of his calls to the staff, you'll see a president deeply involved in the substance of what was being developed. The staff was extraordinary. They developed a flow chart that John Jay students may have seen in textbooks on criminology, a visual take on how the courts, police, and corrections interact. The first time, if I remember correctly, that such a connection had ever been made. Some very good things resulted from that study. If you've ever called 911, you can thank the Johnson Commission. A national emergency number was just one of its more than 200 recommendations, including more training for police who were then in a primal state of being. But as I, as I said, the commission was organized in 1965, just as the civil rights movement had reached the pinnacle of legislative victories with the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. A great moment in American history. But two years later, when the commission reported its finding and its recommendations, race riots across the country were playing out in the streets and on television screens. And crime had become entrenched in the minds of millions as racial behavior. Those riots created a backlash of white voters who didn't understand the history of the riots and didn't try to understand the causes or who simply wanted to believe the worst about black people. They became confused, those riots, with mass demonstrations for peace in Vietnam and civil rights. And Richard Nixon saw his opening. Whereas Democrats had long been the party of white supremacy and segregation, but had now gone over to the other side to champion equal rights for all, the Republican Party claimed the vacuum. Nixon 
ran as champion of the forgotten white man, calling on the silent white majority to join him on the barricades. Then his war on drugs became an even more powerful, racially based strategy. Let me read you what one of Nixon's closest advisors said about that strategy. John Ehrlichman. You want to know what this is really about? We had two enemies, the anti-war left and black people. We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or against blacks. But by hitting the hippies with marijuana and the blacks with heroin and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings, and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Then Ehrlichman added, and I quote, did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. Fast forward to Ronald Reagan. He knew how to play the race card. He launched his campaign for the president by appearing in Mississippi near the scene where three civil rights workers had been murdered by white supremacists in 1964. He invoked states' rights, spelled white supremacy. In his campaign, he would say, if you are a slum dweller, you can get an apartment with 11-foot ceilings, with a 20-foot balcony, a swimming pool and gymnasium, a laundry room and playroom, and the rent beginning at $133.20, and that includes utilities. That was a lie. Some of you are old enough to remember Reagan's notorious welfare queen, who was presumably black. She used 80 names, he said, 30 addresses, and 15 television numbers to collect food stamps, Social Security, veterans' benefit for four non-existent decreased, deceased veteran husbands, as well as welfare. Her tax-free cash income alone, said Reagan, had been running $150,000 a year. That was a lie. The woman in question was charged with using four aliases, not 80. She was convicted of fraudulently collecting $8,000, not $150,000. And far from being typical, she was a unique character with an extraordinary propensity for criminality. But the welfare queen fit the popular stereotype of the day as well as Republican ideology. She was black undeserving, and a woman. And the story caught on like wildfire and helped make Ronald Reagan president. The first George Bush succeeded Reagan thanks to the Willie Horton ad. Willie Horton was a convicted felon serving a life sentence for murder. While he was released from a Massachusetts prison on a weekend furlough program, he, he escaped and raped a woman. Then Governor Michael Dukakis had supported the prison furlough system, and you would have thought from the ad that he had ordered the assault on the woman. Dukakis lost, but the Willie Horton ad further coupled with race, and race coupled with the politics of vindictive punishment. And by 1992, Americans were awash in fear, fear of offenders, fear of gangs, fear of teenage super predators. And the Democratic candidate, Bill Clinton, had earlier years, years earlier, decided that the party's best hope was to win those voters back by aligning themselves with a more conservative criminal justice policy. As Bruce Shapiro wrote in The Nation, crime became to Clinton as illegal immigration is to Donald Trump. A way of reassuring fearful, alienated white voters, especially in the South. Fast forward again 
The Obama administration tried to rein in use of harsh federal sentencing laws. They instructed federal prosecutors not to charge certain offenders, especially low-level or first-time drug dealers, with anything that would trigger mandatory minimum sentences, which can require as long as 10 years or more for the possession of relatively small amount of drugs. The number of federal inmates sentenced to a mandatory minimum on drug charges dropped in 2014 and has been declining ever since. The federal prison population has been shrinking and bipartisan support had been shifting away from mandatory minimum sentences as research showed that incarceration does little to improve public safety and disproportionately impacts communities of color. Politicians have also realized that running prisons costs money until now. Now you have to hit the pause button, maybe even the stop button, because the Trump administration is taking us back to the politics of lock them up and throw away the keys. Attorney General Jeff Sessions, as you know, has reversed Obama guidelines for how to deal with drug offenders. He's directed federal prosecutors to charge defendants with the most serious, readily provable offense in nearly all cases. And he's told prosecutors he wants them unhandcuffed. He wants them to get tough. Severity is in our DNA. Last year, I interviewed James Whitman last fall who teaches at Yale Law School and had recently published a book with the unsettled title, Hitler's American Model. One day Whitman had pulled down from his bookshelf Hitler's Mein Kampf. As he read it, he began to note the positive references to American racism, including Hitler's praise for the American Immigration Act of 1924, parenthesis, which we undid in the Immigration Act of 1964, 1965, here on, at the Statue of Liberty. But the Immigration Act of 1924 conditioned entry into the United States on race-based tables of national origins. Whitman looked further. He came upon a speech Hitler had made in 1928 in which he expressed admiration for Americans who had, quote, gunned down the millions of redskins to a few hundred thousand and now kept the modest remnant under observation in a cage. Whitman dug further still. Not only did he come to understand better the darkest chapter of, Ameri of German legal history, he shined a light on the sins of America's own past. Here's what he writes, quote, you must read this book. You must get it into your curriculum here. We will not understand the history of National Socialist Germany, and more importantly, the place of America in the larger history of world racism unless we reckon with these facts. In the early 1930s, and I'm still quoting, Nazi lawyers were engaged in creating a race law founded on anti-miscegenation and race-based immigration, naturalization, and second-class citizenship law. They went looking for foreign models, and they found them in the United States of America. This is not in the deep past. The committee of lawyers that met at Nuremberg to draft what would eventually become the laws of Nuremberg, the anti-discriminatory law, met on June 5th, 1934, the year of my birth. The Germans were especially inspired by laws in southern states designed to denigrate and keep down African Americans. Because, he said, the Nazis had a shared commitment of white supremacy, in part because they realized that it had been successful in helping to create America's economic prosperity. And he discovered the ultimate ugly irony that when the Nazis rejected American practices, it was sometimes not because they found them too enlightened, but because they found them too harsh. 
It would be wrong to close this book, he writes, without pointing to at least one contemporary realm of American law in which the resulting dangers of our past are still making themselves felt. The realm is American criminal justice. American criminal justice is spectacularly and frighteningly harsh by international standards. It includes practices that are sometimes uncomfortably reminiscent of those introduced by the mad Nazis. Give me an example, I asked him. And he answered, oh boy, certainly one crucial answer is the sheer capacity of American politics and politicians to shape American criminal law and American criminal justice. Politicians in the U.S. run on tough on crime platforms. It has to be added as well that both judges and prosecutors are elected officials in much of the U.S. That's something unheard of in the rest of the world. And frankly, more human traditions of the law do little to stand in the way of translating the demands of politicians into law. In that respect, he concludes, the situation in the U.S. is quite, really quite different from what we found now in the rest of the world. I simply have to say it, the accessibility of the legal system to political influence was exactly what the radical Nazis admired most about America in the 1930s. And that's what's doing tremendous damage to our criminal justice system today. James Whitman, Yale Law School, Hitler's American model. I'll close with a story briefly. It's not mine. It was written by that remarkable author of imagination, Ursula Le Guin who died recently. I'd interviewed her many years ago at her home in California, and she put me on to this, one of her shortest stories, which I will briefly summarize. It takes place in a mythical town of Omelas, a beautiful little town of red roofs and painted walls, with old moss-grown gardens, lovely parks, and gracious public buildings and neat homes graced by porches filled with flowers, a fairy tale kind of place situated by the sea. As the story opens, the summer festival is underway. Music and laughter fill the air. The cobblestones resonate with the dancing feet. Music and laughter fill the air. Tower bells chime the hour. Children play and sing, jugglers and magicians cast their spell as swallows glide above the balloons around them. Their gray-haired couples walk arm in arm beneath the trees, smiling. Here, young lovers spoon on the bluff overlooking the sea. Everyone seems happy in Omelas. Look again. In a cellar beneath the town, in a room with one locked door and no window, a child sits on a filthy floor, hungry, weak, and frightened. Its belly protrudes over spindly legs. Sores cover its buttocks and thighs, the fruits of its own excrement. The child used to scream and cry a lot at night. Now it softly whines and moans. Sometimes the door rattles fiercely and opens, and someone comes to fill the meager food bowl and water jug, pausing at times to kick the child. Once in a while, faces appear in an opening in the door, and the child pleads, let me out, please, let me out. But no one ever answers. Townspeople are allowed to peek into the cellar room, but the terms are absolute. There may not be even a kind word spoken to the child. Everyone in Omelas knows the child is there. 
And most understand why. Most know that their happiness, the prosperity of the city, their friendships, the health of their children, the wisdom of their scholars, even the abundance of their harvest depend wholly on this child's abominable misery. They know it would be a good thing if the child were brought up into the sunlight out of that vile space, cleaned and fed and cared for. But if it were done, on that day, the prosperity and beauty and delight of Omelas would wither and vanish. Those are the terms to throw away the happiness of thousands for the chance of happiness by one would be to let guilt into the town and with guilt responsibility. So they begin to justify. Even the child were released, they said. It's too degraded and imbecile to experience any real joy, much too so to go to work and make a life for itself. It's been afraid too long ever to be free of fear, they say. After those so long in the darkness underground, it would probably be wretched in the light. And besides, it's the existence of the child and their knowledge of its existence that makes possible evenings like this. The nobility of their architecture, the poignancy of their music, the profundity of their science, and the wonders of their wealth. If the wretched creature were not there, they know, sniveling in the dark, what would become? of their beloved civilization. Take this for what you will, a fairy tale, parable, allegory, or fable. The truth is that our way of life was built on trails of tears, lynching trees, shackles and whips, and working people subjugated to the appetite for profit. Mass incarceration is but the latest incarnation of the American dictum that some must lose, lose so others can win. I leave you with the words of Tocqueville. While society in the United States gives the example of the most extended liberty the prisons of the same country offer the spectacle of the most complete despotism. Thank you, guys and Kathy, for speaking to that despotism. Thank you.